element object will get freed and then in the process of doing so it'll see that it has a pointer to C tree node and it will decrement the reference count to C tree node. And what you have there is that the C tree node reference count um, becomes zero and so uh, when the reference count is zero the object gets freed and uh, event param still retains a pointer to freed memory. And this is the classic uh, use after free vulnerability. So if an attacker can actually use uh, controlled heap allocations, they can replace the freed block with a crafted heap block. And this is actually, you know, amazingly easy. You know, heaps, like uh, heaps on modern operating systems are very deterministic. And because what you're doing is you're exploiting this in JavaScript, all you need to do is look up what the size of that C tree node object is in memory, and then just do a bunch of memory allocations of that exact size. And if you do, you know, usually in the first few, uh, the Windows heap will return that same memory that the event param still points to. And in doing so, you, like if you, you now have a pointer or a way to operate on that object from JavaScript and you have, you know, a stale reference to it. And actually the, one of the harder things to find is not just the way to allocate this object, but a way to allocate this object that gives you full control over it. And so the trick is, at least for this vulnerability, was we needed to control the C++ V table, which is in the first four bytes. And so if you think of the first thing that comes to mind of how are we going to allocate this object, um, you know, the, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is we'll, we'll just use a JavaScript string. Um, the problem with that is in JavaScript strings, the first four bytes are, um, are the length. And so that's obviously not going to help because we're, you know, getting the, uh, the length to be equal to the, you know, the address of our fake V table on the heap means we're going to have a huge string. So we're going to try and find something else. And so if, if you go through IE, you can find a number of places where they do memory allocations that do let you control the, both the size and the full contents, the first four bytes and the rest. And so once you do that, you can have a fully uh, crafted C tree node object. So you just cause that allocation, overwrite it with custom data, and you now have controlled the full C tree node. What we do with that is, you know, for a, I'll call it just a simple naive exploit that uses like a heap spray, we're just going to point that into the heap spray. So that address the 0C, 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 sort of the common, you know, I've sprayed the heap, there's a bunch of stuff there. And so our crafted C tree node will have a fake V table pointer or sorry, crafted C tree node actually has the pointer to the C element. The C element has the fake V table. And basically what we do is we just kind of have a self-referential data structure here. And because we've sort of laid everything out in the heap, we can kind of use, um, and we use sort of a, a standard block size, we use different offsets within that block to represent different pointers. And so that lets us have a pointer to an object and it points to another object and another object and I'll just sort of, um, it's all sort of crammed into the same memory, but we just need to make sure that the pointer dereferences actually work out. And finally, when we have the element that is the, uh, that represents the fake V table, what it's going to have is the V table pointer that gets used is going to be our stack pivot. And so in this, in this exploit, we use the exchange EAX ESP stack pivot. And because, um, you know, when a C++ code calls a V table, um, it's, in, at least in this code, would, it would load the V table into EAX and then do the function call. So EAX pointed to our, you know, heap sprayed memory. And uh, so then we do the stack pivot and then what happens then is our stack pointer now points to the heap spray and we need to make sure, you know, since we put a lot of pointers there, um, there are self-referential, we need to make sure that we don't try and return to that pointer in a way that'll just make things crash. And so I just put in some addresses of like, for instance, the address of a pop ret we can use to skip over pointers. And then once we skip over that, we, we can just put the address of a return instruction and that kind of, uh, you know, functions as a pseudo nop. You know, some, I like calling it a rop nop just because it sounds silly. Um, but that's basically what it does. It lets you build like a rop nop slide or a rop nop sled. It's, we got to figure out better terminology for this because it's actually really silly. Um, and so basically when we do this, you know, it goes straight to our, you know, our ret sled and right at the end of that, after a sufficient amount, have uh, a return oriented payload stage, which is very much what um, I demonstrated earlier. So then that sta payload stage actually just goes through and does, um, uh, you know, all that stuff I talked about before, executes our Metasploit payload, boom, we win. So let's actually see what that looks like. All right, we can load up. All right, cool. All right, so basically what I have here is just a, okay, cool, it's loading. Um, 
simple web page. My, uh, my um, exploit is written in JavaScript. So what that means is I just have, actually I'll, I can, can show you here. Make sure to show you the man behind the curtain. Load a JavaScript file. When I click run exploit, runs main. Main does a whole bunch of magic. So you ready? But I actually, usually I make a comment to this part of my presentations about making a sacrifice to the demo gods. But um, this time, I'm gonna, I didn't do that. So I'm going to run flagrantly in the face of the demo gods and see if uh, this actually still works. OK, cool. Got a calculator. So and then we can close it and well, we can get another one. Um, we can kind of do this as many times as we want. Um, <laughs> whoops. Because actually in the future when everything is on the web, we won't actually have desktop calculators. And if we want to launch one, we'll have to go to an exploit web page to actually run one for us. <laughs> um, so that's how that works. All right, uh, back to the presentation. That is not what I wanted to do. See, I can own IE8, but I can't operate PowerPoint. All right, so let's uh, draw some conclusions from this. So one of the, the key points I'm trying to make is we need to have an accurate depiction of what uh, our exploit mitigations actually provide us. And to be fair, DEP and ASLR do a great job of protecting server-side vulnerabilities um, or mitigating server-side vulnerabilities because you have a much less uh, control surface. And so that's what they're designed for and that's what they work very well on. On client-side applications, because you have a lot of different code bases in the, in the uh, program, it's a little more, a little trickier. So, if you have no ASLR, all your exploitation requires is building a reusable return-oriented payload from any common DLL. So you can choose any one, like on Windows XP. You know, if you're looking at IE8 on XP Service Pack 3, you can just choose any one that you like. I have my favorites. I'll let you pick your own. Um, if you have, you know, an ASLR system that has, you know, one or more modules that does not opt into ASLR. All you need to do is find which one that is and solely use that for your return oriented, you know, return oriented exploitation. And this may require a variety of strategies. You can do a little bit of ROP, a little borrowed instructions, a little bit regret to libsy. You kind of have to mix and match often to, you know, get, to get what you need. Um, but, you know, one thing you'll find is if you look at a lot of common plugins and even a lot of common web browsers, there'll be one, you know, one or two DLLs that still don't opt fully into ASLR. Um, so if you just get, bring them up in a debugger, you can usually find them. So if you're in a situation where all modules opt into ASLR, um, well, you're a little, uh, it's a little trickier. What you're going to need to do is find a memory address disclosure vulnerability to actually um, reveal the address of a DLL and then use that to build your ROP stage and execute that. And if you want details on how to do that, um, you can read a paper by Peter Grundlehill, um, who won Pwn to Own this year. And he described his technique where he found a, if I recall, an issue where you had a, you had a non-null terminated string. And what he could do is he could allocate that on the heap and do a little heap manipulation so that the string would be allocated right before a C++ object. And then when he read the non-terminated string, it would actually re, you know, bleed into the next, uh, the next heap object. And the first thing he'd see would be the C++ V table of another object. Well, the V table pointer points to the text segment of a loaded DLL, so he could read that V table from JavaScript. So now he knew where a DLL that he knew the type of, or he knew he knew that DLL X is at location Y, and he could use that to rebuild his return oriented, you know, return oriented exploitation stuff, you know, to retune his exploit and go. So it, what, the, the point is that if you have full ASLR, you now need kind of two vulnerabilities to get code executing. And what this does is, you know, keep in mind, you know, you do not need malicious code to do malicious computation. And the mitigations do a, um, you know, a pretty good job of, you know, making this more difficult. But overall, we still don't, and desktop applications in particular, we still don't have enough, uh, in my opinion, separation, you know, privilege reduction and all this stuff. Because once you get code executing, you know, for, if you look at like IE8, um, you have, you're executing in low integrity mode. So low integrity mode doesn't let me write to any files outside of you know, certain locations, but it's enough to run a calculator, it's enough to run, read all your sensitive uh, data. If you happen to be a computer on a network, which you probably are if you're getting exploited over the web, um, you can still you know, go over the network as that user. A lot of things you can do that you do not necessarily want. So that's not exactly um, as thorough a, um, 
a privilege reduction as something like Google Chrome Sandbox, which has, uh, you know, is increasingly, um, increasingly restrictive. And if you looked at uh, Tavis and Julian's talk earlier today, even in environments like that, you still have a wide open kernel attack surface that you might need to actually break out of that. And what we're seeing is that to, which is a good thing, you know, now to have a meaningful client-side exploit, you need to chain together multiple vulnerabilities to actually really do damage. And that'll actually put us in a better place because otherwise, you know, one exploit ruins your day and that's you're cleaning up infected machines and so on with all your IP and all this bad stuff. So um, I think we need to kind of think more about how we can structure our applications in a way that'll contain that flow because as we've seen, firewalls, you know, contain and reduce the attack surface on the network. We don't have that option for client-side applications. We can't turn off the sketchy functionality in, you know, Adobe Reader, IE, Firefox, whatever, um, as a user. So that's my last bit of rant. Um, now I'll open up to questions, and you can ask questions now. Email me, follow me on the Twitterverse, hit my webpage, whatever. So, uh, are there any questions? All right, that makes it really easy. Cool. All right, have fun. Thanks. <laughs>